This is Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest today is Chris Holden. He is a member of the California State Assembly. You've been on the job a couple of months now. How's it going? So far, so good. Yeah, I'm enjoying I was gonna it. Say, I was yeah. going to say, let's talk about the housing market, if we may. Okay. I'm so pleased to say that it appears the housing market has made a turn for the better. Yes. But that being said, there still are communities that are struggling, right. some in the eastern portion of your district. Yeah. I know you go. Do you cross the San Bernardino line? I do. You do. So Upland and... Right. Um, and so Rancho you do area. see some foreclosures hitting some of your uh, residents. Talk to us about that and what you're trying to do to assist. Right. Well, I think, you know, it's one of those situations where families are still coming out of the, the downturn in the, in the housing market and the economy. It's mm. starting to pick up. We're seeing that. And I think those are some really good signs out there. But there are still families in that that are falling between the cracks. So we wanted to try to to take a stab at trying to make it a little bit easier mm -hmm. for them, especially families that are in transition and working with their mortgage companies right. so that they may be right there, uh, but they still have a couple of months where they need to fill in the gap. And so we have a bill that we've put forward, AB 132, mm -hmm. which essentially is giving uh, individuals an opportunity to take cash out their 401k ah. without getting penalized at the state level. Now, the federal level, it's a different story, but at least we would be able to create some relief and for them to be able to use their 401k to help make a mortgage payment to fill in the gap. Might you be able to work with, for example, Congresswoman Judy Chu, who I think overlaps with your district, yes. to try to get some federal relief because it does seem as if it's a sensible solution? Yeah, I think so. Um, we'll probably look to embark on that. I know that's been tried before uh, at the federal level. There hasn't been success oh, no, to date. Oh, really? Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's not an opportunity to come back around. I think first things first, if we're able to be successful at the state level, it certainly would give momentum for Congresswoman Chu or others to be able to sure. pick up as, on that. As California goes, so goes the nation, we would hope. In, indeed. I want to ask you about another uh, interesting proposal. You may not be aware of it, so if you're not, it's okay. Just yeah. uh, I'll talk you through it. Yeah. A, a San Bernardino County has talked about acquiring by eminent domain mortgages to prevent foreclosure. Have you mm, heard about this? I have not. Yeah, I mean, this is just kind of percolating in the news. It's caused a lot of consternation. Yeah. I don't want to quiz you on it since you're not aware of this plan, but yeah. what do you make, at least, Assemblyman, about these efforts to try to create creative solutions yeah. to the crisis, albeit it's getting better? Yeah, I think it's. I think what is important is that the those who are in government are listening and they're trying to be creative, think outside the box to some degree on how to create additional stimulation for the, uh, to the economy. And, and certainly that's a, a very provocative. Uh, <laughs> that's a good word. That's a good SAT <laughs> word, quite provocative. Quite provocative right. approach, but um, one can uh, certainly at least applaud that there's some thinking going on and trying to get one's arms around, you know, what uh, each individual family seems to be going through and how to be you know, responsive sure. to their concerns. You've spoken about economic development, mm -hmm. and there is no doubt that California is just itching to get out of this malaise. Yeah. I think we've turned the corner. Yeah. Uh, one issue as it relates to economic development, as I understand it, is regulation mm -hmm. and the regulatory environment in California. Mm -hmm. Surely you were at the recent State of the State address, and mm -hmm. I was intrigued by the fact that both the governor and the lieutenant governor, both Democrats, mm -hmm. talked about the need for regulatory reform. Mm -hmm. I believe that's on your agenda. Well, we're looking at that. We think that it's important that um, small, medium-sized businesses be given an opportunity to um, to operate and, and thrive. I mean, I've come across so many uh, companies in recent times here who have said that, you know, whether it's Kaiser Permanente as one of the right. largest employers in the state, um, Safeway right. and, and others, but they've said, look, California is our home. We don't want to go anywhere. You know, are there some challenges that we have to overcome to make it a little easier for us? Yes, it might be helpful. Um, but certainly at the small and medium-sized uh, businesses, right. I think at that level we can do more. So what else are you doing? I know your first bill was what's known as a spot bill. Is it yeah, a a AB9 yeah. was a spot bill. And one of the things that I thought was very interesting is that in the governor's uh, state of the state, he talked a little bit about enterprise zones. Mm -hmm. And one of the things mm -hmm. I thought was very interesting is that you have to parse his words very carefully because when he says that he's looking at change, 
That's a very important word as opposed to elimination. Yeah, I got to tell you, I was speaking with Congressman Hagman earlier, excuse me, Assemblyman Hagman earlier, uh -huh. a Republican in the uh, California State Assembly, and his sense was maybe Governor Brown was gunning for enterprise zones as he did for redevelopment zones, but you're suggesting I, maybe not. I'm seeing it a little differently. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there's, I think what he's really saying is that they're, they're not, He's not super excited about them, but there may be opportunities to reform them as opposed to completely eliminate, as what, which is what we did with redevelopment well, agencies. Well, along those lines, we had thought, those watching, that last year after redevelopment was eliminated, mm -hmm. that there would be, I guess, redevelopment 2.0. Some right. version would come back, be it focused on affordable housing, whatever form it may take. It didn't happen in 2012. Right. Do you think as part of potential enterprise zone reform, we will see redevelopments, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, well, renaissance. renaissance. Yeah, right. well, I think that there are tools, it, it, I think it's a viable tool. You know, there, there Look needs at Pasadena. to be. Pasadena, a lot of communities have been able to, especially in the 41st, have right. been able to do right. great work in their redevelopment of their downtowns. And they still need those tools. There's still blight that needs to be eradicated, and it creates jobs along the way. And so to that end, if we can figure out a way to make it a viable tool for small businesses to then go out and hire, I think that was the fundamental goal that was really important that we needed to focus on with uh, enterprise zones. And I think that there's a way that we can get around to making that work. I think, quite frankly, um, I would have preferred not to see redevelopment just scrapped completely. But I think how that diplomatic of you to say it that way. <laughs> I mean, I have spoken with councilmen and former councilmen that are just, I mean, you can see the smoke coming out of their ears yeah. when you talk about redevelopment's re elimination. Or elimination. Exactly. Uh, there's no doubt that there were some abuses. Mm -hmm. We've heard of golf courses, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But you think of some cities, Los Angeles, Pasadena, mm -hmm. Riverside, they seem to have used redevelopment effectively. Mm -hmm. And so what's your sense? I know you're not there for long, but do you think we will see the renaissance of redevelopment? No. No. No, I think that... Really? Uh, yeah, I think the governor... Well. I, I, I think, think anyone, you're right, probably. Yeah, I'm not sure anyone really wants to, anyone meaning legislator wants to get into a, a, a fight with the governor. It burns up a lot of time and energy and, and political capital. But I think the, the approach in which I was, what I was trying to do was listen to what the governor was saying and what doors did he leave cracked open that would give us an opportunity to turn to cities, to the League of California cities and say, here's maybe an area that we can talk about um, giving a tool back to cities to try to be more viable. But as we speak today, there's not a lot of gossip about it in the halls of Sacramento on the issue of redevelopment. It's not on top of mind. Uh, no. But if it comes up, it's, it's sure. not something that uh, it's given a lot of encouragement. Well, let's talk about what you all are talking about in Sacramento, and that's the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, the governor recently issued his proposed budget for 1314, mm -hmm. and I guess it's balanced. I can't believe I'm saying those words. Do you do you th do you agree with that analysis? Um, it is balanced, and I think that it was uh, put together in a thoughtful way. And some of the themes that the governor focused on, he even touched on climate control as one of the areas uh, that yes. he would like to see us. Pay as did attention President to. Obama in the inaugural address. Exactly. It says a lot about where the country and state is that those terms aren't off limits anymore. Exactly. That you would say it in such a public form. Yeah, I mean, he talked about uh, jobs and job creation. He talked about uh, water and how water oh. issues are going to become very important for us to deal with right. uh, in time uh, goes forward. Um, whiskey's worth, what is it, John Jean? Whiskey's worth fighting, uh, whiskey's worth drinking, water's worth fighting over? <laughs> I think that's the expression. Our cameraman said that to me the other day. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. Right, right. Uh, and so as long as we're talking about water, I know he's a big proponent of looking at, I guess, peripheral canal part two. Yeah, well, uh, he has these, these ideas about the tunnel, you know, in right. terms of how that could be used to mm -hmm. create uh, uh, more efficiency uh, of use. Um, but, you know, this has been a northern, southern California fight for, for decades, and uh, I think that there's going to, and, and also agribusness has right. its uh, an environmentalist. Oh. There. So, so there's a lot of... There's a lot of ground there that needs to be covered uh, very diplomatically. And Chris Holden, I want to thank you for joining us, member of the California State Assembly. When we come back, we'll be speaking with Fred Sykes. He is a member of the West Covina City Council. I'm Brad Palmer. It's you're watching Charter, California Edition.
It's California edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. I'm glad you're still with us. Our guest, Frederick Sykes, he is a member of the West Covina City Council. And sir, we just spoke with Chris Holden. He is now a member of the California State Assembly. He was on the Pasadena City Council. And what they're doing in Pasadena is they've appointed a placeholder for three months and then they will hold an election of the people to find his replacement. Now in West Covina, Michael Tui was recently elected to a water board. He had been on your council, so he has resigned. What steps is West Covina taking to replace Mr. Tui on the council? Well, it's very sad that uh, it's been a short process uh, in that the people oftentimes don't pay attention to the last city council meeting. Uh, they um, offered to uh, do a process of uh, submitting a letter. They asked residents to submit a letter. It was in the paper, and they only had maybe three or three or four days. And submit a letter to say what? <clears throat> to say that they were interested. Letters of interest to for, seek the, for an the city council to seek an appointment. Okay. Exactly. So it's letters of interest uh, to fill the vacancy uh, made by Tui's election to the water board. And I really don't think that we have that that communication that, that we needed for it. So your first concern is that the war didn't get out in a significant way that there was an appointment to be made by the council. Now what's interesting exactly. is you've recently appointed someone to your council yes. because in 2012 there was a threat of a recall against several members yes. excluding yourself and one member, instead of fighting the recall, which ultimately did not qualify, resigned. Correct. She just said, I'm done. It really disappointed me uh, because um, uh, folks know that I'm, I'm, I've been paying attention since right. as, hard, as much as I can since 2006. And I was really disappointed to see a well-loved uh, uh, representative. Um, in 2009, Council Member uh, Lane, she got the most votes mm. out of the people who, who ran. And I was one of the runners in, in 09. Right. And, and to me, th that was such a, a disappointment because I was looking forward to working with someone that had so much trust uh, so, from the people. So we're using this <clears throat> West Covina example as kind of a metaphor for the machinations of elective office and how people move on, they resign, they get elected to other positions. The Pasadena example is one that I understand you think was the right step to take. You maybe put a placeholder in for three months and then you have an election. What's frustrating you as I understand it is that the city council will ultimately appoint Mr. Tui's successor, but there will not be a, a bona fide election until that term concludes, which is in almost two years, is that accurate, or at the end of this year? No, it'll be the end of this year. There would be three council members that would be up for re-election uh, at uh, November. And so, but that's just a coincidence of timing that this seat is coming up in November 2013. Is that accurate? Yes, yes. And so your <clears throat> belief is that we should be seeing an election that to have, you know, two out of five council members be appointed is troublesome. I don't want to speak for you. I want you to you know, give me a sense <clears throat> of, I'm glad of where you you're coming. I'm from. glad you feel uh, that frustration that I have uh, because this is the second uh, appointment and that's a large portion of a five member body that where the people did not have a direct input. The question that the public should be asking is, why is it that this is the second time we didn't get that input. So why is it? Is there something in the <clears throat> West Covina Code which doesn't allow an election upon the resignation of a member? Or was it a vote of the other members of the West Covina City Council that chose to just go strictly through the appointment process? No, sir. It's our financial. Fi oh. It's our financial. And you have to say, well, how do we get in that state? And that's where the problem lies. So you could have an election. There's nothing that we precludes We could it. have an election. It's the finances, the money. We should have had an election for uh, 2011. Right. The, when, when, when Council Member Lane, if we were in good health, and that's the point I want to bring up. If this city was in good health, if the city of West Covina was in good health, we had a, a, a healthy reserve, 
then we, we, we should have had uh, an election in 2011 to replace the retiring council member Lane. But there's no um, <clears throat> election with which you can consolidate. There's no county election coming up. Uh, area election, it would have to be your own election? It would have to be a, a special election. And the main thing is, um, in, of course, in um, uh, the February uh, retirement uh, uh, era, uh, that's when, if we were healthy, but that that could have been easily done with right. the elections that came up in the primary and the subsequent elections that followed in November. And so You're talking it about just for the first for the retirement for the first last appointment, year. and so because uh, our folks are just not paying attention, this is why they don't have a clue but what as to why things are in such a disarray. I know it can be expensive to hold an election, absolutely. But what about an all male <clears throat> election? Those are, as I understand, much more economically affordable. Where I all, think was, there's only one state that. It, it, it has a all. I believe that's Oregon. Uh, well, we could. I mean, uh, but uh, yeah, we don't. We don't have uh, in West Covina because I know that yeah. other municipalities have had mail-in elections for special elections in California. In California, okay, no well, that's, that's has done it. Maybe wow, you can look that's into news it. To me, yes, that's something I, mean, I need to research. Maybe that's something to consider. Absolutely, something to consider because we're constantly trying to figure out how to offset that apathy. How do we make it easier for folks to vote? The state did a wonderful job and making it so now you can register online. Right. Now, if you are in incarcerated, you can uh, register and vote. Not if you're a felon, uh, if you're a Thank you, that's the only problem, is that if you convicted, once you get convicted right. of a felony, now you lose that right. But even then, after you pay your, your, your penance to mm -hmm. society, you can restore your vote. So my, the bottom line is, there's no excuse but let me for ask not you voting. This. Even though in your mind, or paying attention, right? <laughs> Excuse me. Even though in your mind there is an apathy, and there weren't, uh, there wasn't enough notice given to West Covina residents that this appointment was going to be made. As I understand it, as we speak today, 17 folks who did apply. That's a pretty good number. That's a pretty good number, but uh, usually the people who participate are from one particular segment of town. One club. One, one, one club, one click, mm -hmm. uh, one setup that controls the city, and, and that is, is sad in and of itself. And then the other thing is that uh, the apathy, and this is again where people have to understand how the broad spectrum of apathy and what it brings, it allows for everything in West Covina to be purchased, especially when it comes from the, the city council, mm -hmm. how you get elected. You got to have the uh, the finances when people aren't paying attention. Well, that's people, not just West people Covina. Are well, I mean, <laughs> I'm just talking about West Covina. Yeah, you know, we know that that's Money talks. that all politics yeah. is local. So right. I'm just focusing on Fair West enough. Covina, but all politics is local. Mm -hmm. So you got to have the money. So that means you have a trash company that can own the city. And if you look at the contract of West Covina, they own us. That has been. Discussed. If you look at if you look at the the um, uh, the development, and and what the city has lost in the way of amenities that, that really help us with our quality of life. It goes right back to that bottom line, money, M-O-N-E-Y. And, and that's because the apathy, people aren't paying attention, the money will flow, and then what are they doing? They're trying to get the money so they can stay elected, but when the people get involved, they can circumvent that. I understand, but, but four of you will ultimately select the individual who takes that fifth slot. Only be three. There will only be three of you that will select? Well, all four get to vote. Yes, yes. And mm -hmm. so have you, spoken with one of your constituents about applying and trying to coalesce your council around that individual? You know, um, for lack of a better word, uh, there's a gang. And when you use the term gang, that usually talks about uh, power and, mm. and, 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 and oftentimes- So you're in a minority of And oftentimes of one things that, 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 that could be adverse, right. it could be adverse to your interests when you have a gang that's involved. Oh, these are fighting words. <laughs> Will you come back and talk more about it? Oh, wait. His name is Frederick Sykes. He is a member of the West Covina City Council. When we come back, we'll be speaking with Jackie Robinson. She's on that Pasadena City Council that I just mentioned. I'm Brad Pomerantz. You're watching Charter California Edition.
It's Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined today by Jackie Robinson. Jackie is a member of the City Council in the beautiful city of Pasadena. I want to speak with you about an issue that may not necessarily fall in the ballywick of a city councilwoman, but I think it's an issue that concerns everyone, and that deals with gun violence. It's remarkable to me, Jackie, I must say, I expected that when Gabrielle Giffords, the congresswoman, was shot, in her district in Tucson. That would really galvanize the nation to look at our gun laws, but it didn't really. Mm -hmm. What seemed to have turned the page has been the tragedy out of Sandy Hook Elementary in Newton, Connecticut. Right. Why do you think that is? Well, I think as a country, maybe we've become sort of desensitized to violence, especially as it relates to, I think the thing that turned the page is because Sandy Hook was an incident that involved children. Right young children at that in an elementary school, you know, a place that's supposed to be one of the safest places in any community, of course. Um, a sacred space. And I think that just re-galvanized everyone to take a hard look at community and gun violence and what we can do to resolve it. And what's so interesting about this debate, this discussion is here we are in California and we know that California has amongst the most restrictive gun laws on the books. And there's also not a lot of rustling about it. If anything, uh, polls indicate that Californians want even more strict enforcement and more stringent gun laws. Mm -hmm. Yet our friends in other parts of the country, the middle Midwest, the South, it's the exact opposite. I mean, why is it that we as a unified nation seem to have, in your mind, such differing views on a fundamental question? Well, you know, of course, the Constitution is the basis for all of this, and we definitely have the right to bear arms, but I think that we have to be responsible in that right, just like any of, of the other constitutional mm -hmm. elements. And I think in California, you know, we consider ourselves, I consider us ourselves one of the more progressive states, and I think that's why we have a lot of the gun laws that um, favor safety, public safety, um, while also balancing the self-interest of having the right to bear arms. But I think that we can see, even with the Sandy Hook incident, that there have been more efforts um, to curb gun violence and see, take a strong look at what we can do more in California. The city of Glendale is considering uh, yes. a, a ban on um, gun shows on city property. What I do know you Senator think of that? Kevin DeLeon is um, um, moving legislation for to make our state gun laws stronger as well. So uh, let me ask you about that Glendale proposal because it has caused tremendous consternation uh, amongst business people who own gun shops and gun sh uh, shows. I mean, do you think that it is within the purview of a city to take such strong action to prevent a gun show in city limits? I mean, it definitely is. Um, you know, earlier you mentioned the fact that gun violence is not necessarily a local issue, but I would strongly disagree. I mean, even in the city of Pasadena on Christmas Day, we had an incident of gun violence where um, one of our um, community members, Victor McClendon's, um, tragically lost his life on Christmas Day. Well, but he's not the only victim. Right. This happens in cities, Chicago, there's you know, no, all across the right. nation. I mean, it affects cities without a doubt. And most often cities operate their local police departments. Pasadena has its own police department. But cities don't have a lot of ability to legislate gun laws. And so that's where it's kind of an interesting dynamic. Although Glendale, no doubt, is taking a very bold step in its efforts to try to, at some level, limit gun sales by limiting and, gun shows. And, and I think rightfully so. I mean, city property is owned by the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And um, from what I understand, it's, it's, it's a move that's been strongly supported by their, their constituents and their residents. And so I think that's a right that they um, have. That doesn't mean gun shows can't happen it, in Glen, the city of Glendale. It just means it can't happen on city property. And there's plenty of private spaces where it can take place. But in, even in those private spaces, it has to be done responsibly. And I know President Obama is moving forward, or at least trying to move forth legislation right now um, as a nation that can make gun laws stronger across the nation. And we see those efforts are sincere. We see those efforts are dedicated. But we know that for better or for worse, the National Rifle Association wields a lot of power in Washington, D.C and the Congress is dominated by Republicans. They do have a majority on the House side. And so there's a lot of skepticism about whether federally we can see movement on the question of stricter gun regulation. 
What do you believe will happen on the national side? I mean, I definitely think that there will be um, pros and cons when the discussion ensues in Congress. Um, but I think even on the Republic, Republican side, no one was no one was not heartfelt and swayed by what happened in mm -hmm. Newtown, Connecticut. And I think that was a turning point for the country and hopefully a turning report a turning point for the Republican side to take a, a fresh look with open eyes, with compassion at the issue and, and, and hopefully come to some sort of compromise with the president. But, and but the here's the challenge, the NRA, for those that are looking for more regulation, the NRA has become incredibly effective as it relates to fundraising. And they are able to give out tens of millions of dollars to candidates around the nation. The gun control advocacy groups have not been effective at fundraising. The Brady campaign gives a pittance compared to the NRA. So, you know, I'm not by definition suggesting that it, money, the NRA money is a corrupting influence, but look, I mean, you got to raise money. I mean, money is at the heart of all politics, it whether it's, you know, gu gun issues, whether it's, uh, you know, state budgets, whether it's just running for office as so a candidate. I is it time for the gun control advocates to start looking at methods to outgun the NRA in the fundraising game? Well, I think that that effort is be tr being trying to be made, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I think this is going to be an issue that's not necessarily going to be just played out, you know, with, with ads on TV and headlines. It's an issue that's going to be played out in the chambers of Congress, in, um, in, in communities. And President Obama has said that he's not going to be able to get this legislation to improve um, less access to, gun, to guns for the American people and to um, make safer communities without on the ground grassroots support from community members regular well, regular constituents of the United States rising up and saying this is we want this you know this he, will make our community safer. He is going into campaign mode. I mean, I mean Obama for America is now called Organizing for America and he is really working hard to try to keep the momentum moving forward on gun control but then you have other raging debates on immigration on fiscal matters I mean he's got I a mean, full plate. I mean he definitely plate. has a full plate ahead of him in his second term you know Politics is not necessarily all about what you had in your mind plan. Right. Nobody could have imagined that this something like this would happen and this would be on his agenda, but, but it is, and he should rightfully so be addressing it. But let me ask you, I mean, you're a councilwoman of one of uh, this region's finest cities, and so I want to get a sense from you. When you speak to your constituents, is the issue of gun violence on top of mind? Is it jobs? Is it immigration? What, what are people clamoring for? Well, in Pasadena right now... Is it the um, Rose Bowl? I mean, what is it? Is it football? <laughs> we have a multitude of issues in Pasadena, but gun violence is actually, at the, and community violence in general is at the top um, of our issues that we're dealing with right now, especially because, like I mentioned earlier, um, we have had a series of shootings in the city of Pasadena mm -hmm. over the holiday holidays that especially brought attention to it. Uh, we just had an opportunity to present uh, to appoint uh, a new council member to to, right. uh, to fill um, now assembly member Holden's seat, and you know of the five candidates, all of them mentioned um, community violence, really? youth development, jobs, and economic development as issues that are important to the city, but also important to that district as well. So, councilwoman, is Pasadena going to do anything vis-a-vis -vis gun violence, similar to what Glendale did? Um, yes, um, we'll see in the coming weeks that the Public Safety Committee will be um, dealing with this issue at its uh, next committee meeting. And uh, in fact, the, the conversation has already started as a community. All Saints Church um, held a community forum on gun violence um, led by um, former Chancellor Jack Scott. Of course. Um, right. And, uh, you know, it was very Community well College. attended, mm -hmm. close to 100 people. And so the interest is there, and not just the interest, but the interest to do better. Okay. Her name is Jackie Robinson. She is a member of the City Council in the beautiful city of Pasadena. My name is Brad Pomerantz. This is Charter California Edition.